This is Nursing 622, Module 10. We're going to talk about pregnancy, intrapartum, postpartum. Upon completion, your learning objectives, intrapartum and postpartum stages, diagnostic modalities, treatment of intrapartum and postpartum, and distinguishing pregnancy option care for women. Again, you're not to be an expert in this, but have a general idea. Um, some of you can go into this specialty, and then you would need more of a knowledge base. But this is a background to give you an idea. Preconception counseling, health and lifestyle risks. We've talked about this already um, this semester with smoking and alcohol use, the carcinogens that are in tobacco, the prevalence of women who smoke and have smaller birth weight of babies. Understanding and having these assessments and being supportive in the visits. If your patient says, I'm going to try to quit smoking, and you say, no, I want you to not be smoking at all at your next visit, what kind of rapport are you going to have with that patient? Are we condoning smoking in pregnancy? Absolutely not. But we also have to meet the patient where they are. We have got to make sure that we can develop that trust with this patient. Alcohol use, fetal alcohol syndrome, 5% of births, low birth weight, you know, offer those recovery programs, you know, promote cessation, talk about different strategies um, to help with this. Recreational drugs um, is more prevalent than you'd think of. We screen for those, uh, urine tox screens, we do blood tests. There's lots of different risk factors to the fetus with recreational drugs, um, toxic with the thyroid toxicants, the neurotoxicants with lead, and then it leads to disabilities. And then we go back into that disparity of the self-perception in these kids that are born with these syndromes based on intrapartum or antepartum and intrapartum period. Um, workplace toxicants, um, interventions, MSDS sheets, understanding if they're around fumes or anything like that and being pregnant, looking at all the information that's available. OSHA has it on their website and their employer needs to know that they could possibly be exposing them. And again, it is their right to share their pregnancy. However, if there's a possibility of some type of exposure, it is, it is their responsibility to let that employer know. Birth defects, <clears throat> remember the rapid growth that's in the first 12 weeks, that's when the fetus is most susceptible. <clears throat> we talk about the importance if you're going to be family planning and trying to have children to start prenatal vitamins, folic acid, we want to decrease that chance of neural tube defects. So we look at those teterogens, those class D or X medications that you learned in pharmacology that are totally contraindicated, especially in less than eight weeks. Why? This is when you have rapid cell development, splitting, and growing. So if you're taking medications that are toxic to those fetal cells, this is where you're going to have these birth defects. These are where you're going to have these abnormalities. Then we look at the fetotoxins, nicotine, cocaine, amphetamines, and ACE inhibitors. If they're on an ACE inhibitor for blood pressure, the blood pressure is not well controlled, they need to come off of that, then a plan needs to be developed between you and that OBGYN on what medications are safe for them to take with hypertension. Is labetalol the treatment of choice? Do they see a cardiologist? Can they be on a beta blocker? There's many factors that come into play. And again, taking a good health history is how you're going to identify these things. Looking at Food and Drug Administration classification, reviewing their meds. That's why you review meds at every single visit. Looking at what they're on. And we talk about the herbal supplements and things that they're taking. This is why we push this with you to look at it especially when you're talking about family planning. Common birth defects that are preventable, uh, neural tube defects, why we want you to be taking folic acid if you're doing family planning, usually happens in the first four weeks. Neural tube fails to close, it's due to that folic acid deficiency. So we know spina bifida, 20% is fatal. And cephaly is 100% fatal. So risk factors, diabetes, obesity, medications, and how do we prevent this? 
take your folic acid, take your prenatal pills prior to conceiving, and then throughout your pregnancy. Chronic medical conditions, um, the more common ones is your diabetes, if they have sugars that are four and 500 and not well controlled, you can then have a very large baby. Hemoglobin A1Cs that are elevated showing that there is poor control. We need to screen these patients. If you know they have impaired fasting glucose, we're monitoring this if they're doing family planning. If they're a diabetic and not well controlled, we're telling them, hey, can we try to get this under a little bit better control before you try to conceive? Or how can I help you to get your sugars under control? It's all about that screening and having that dialogue with the patient. HIV and AIDS, it can be transmitted via contact with the infected blood and uh, body fluid. The risk of transmission to infant is less than 1% on antiretrovirals. So that just shows you that education and knowing, hey, you can still have a healthy pregnancy and not pass HIV AIDS on to your child. So if you have that patient, you need to have that dialogue with them if they wanna talk about family planning because that is a huge concern. We have PKU, which we test the babies for when they first come out. We look at screening and diet for that. The torch infections that affects that central nervous system. Look at the immune status before they become pregnant. Toxoplasmosis, why we do not want pregnant women using cleaning up the litter box or doing any of that. We want good hand washing. Varicella is very important to make sure you've looked at vaccinations, screening. We look at parvovirus, rubella. These are all things that we just need to review in our whole discussion with family planning. And if it's unintended and we need to after the fact, okay, then we still talk to them about the screening. We still talk to them about these things. You need to give them all of the information that you have based on this pregnancy. Cytomegalovirus um, is transmitted via excretions. Then you have herpes. If they have an outbreak of genital herpes, of course, we are not gonna want them to have a vaginal delivery. You need to discuss that with them. We do prophylactically treat women who are infected. All women are screened for STDs, both blood and with a pelvic exam culture. And this is the reason why we also look for any lesions in the genital area. We also test for strep B at about 28 weeks. Why? Because we know that we want antibiotics going when, if it's a vaginal delivery to pass that from prevent going uh, and uh, into the fetus through the birth canal. Lead and mercury, mercury levels, mercury can come into play with sushi. Remember that? or different organic foods. If you have a high intake of these fish containing mercury, that can uh, be teratogenic. Genetic disorder, intimate partner violence. Again, we look at the genes, mutations, family health history. This is why it's so important to look. Is there any inherited conditions? Has there been issues with late-term spontaneous abortions? Has there been stillbirths? You know, that all comes into play with pregnancy planning. And then again, we have to have that hard discussion about partner violence. What is the environment that you're in right now? Are you feeling pressured? Is there any issues we need to talk about? We need to screen these patients and refer them if so. The goal for prenatal care is to decrease the morbidity mortality of mom and infant. We want healthy babies, we want healthy moms. Looking at gestational age, if you're at advanced maternal age, which is over the age of 35, you need to have that discussion. You're at a higher risk of you know, abnormalities with your pregnancy, infertility, spontaneous abortions, having that education. Also looking at the very young, you have a 12 year old who's pregnant. Well, we need to have that discussion. You know, what if a 12 year old ends up having to have a C-section because she can't progress through childbirth? 
You know, there's different things that come to, into play. Your body changes that are going to have that risk. How is the environment at home? Understanding the discomforts of pregnancy, nausea, vomiting, very prevalent and common, especially in the first trimester. Usually it happens after that first four weeks. This is when we're finding out we're pregnant. Why? Well, because we're nauseous, our breasts are tender, and we're late on our period. Of course, we have to rule out other causes, but in a childbearing aged female, we always check for pregnancy. What are some options we can do? Alternative medicines, vitamin B6, try to alter the diet, discuss about sitting up after meals, eating small meals, not large meals, especially as you progress further through the pregnancy because you have all that pressure from the uterus enlarging to make way for baby. Heartburn is very common. Um, again, we talk about sitting upright after eating, foods to avoid, chest pain burning, that acid taste. Education is key here to try to help prevent this. There's different medications they can take, dietary changes, elevate the head of the bed, like I just said, um, not eating late at night. Back pain is very common. However, back pain is also what can be an indicator of a urinary tract infection. So we need to make sure that we are evaluating and discussing with the patient about other symptoms associated with it. Not just chalking it up to, oh, you're pregnant, of course your back hurts. Well, what if they have a urinary tract infection? You miss that diagnosis when they come in, they then go into premature labor. These are all things that are important. Yes, we can talk about interventions with the stretching and heat and cold, massage, Tylenol that's safe in pregnancy, but we also need to make sure we're ruling out other causes. Pelvic pain is very uh, common. Uh, remember, you have all these changes going through pregnancy, especially if, there's, if it's their first pregnancy. This is going to be a lot of education, a lot of discussion, and also having that open line of communication. Shortness of breath usually is not common initially in that first trimester as the uterus starts to grow, puts more pressure, pushes up on the diaphragm. You can have that shortness of breath, but again, you need to rule out other conditions. What happens in pregnancy? Increased vasculature, correct? So then we have an increased risk of thrombus, increased risk of pulmonary embolism, increased risk of DVT. Are they walking? Are they moving around? Are they taking frequent breaks, um, you know, and not being sedentary? We look at sleep, sleep disturbances. A lot of women, especially as they progress through their pregnancy, I can't get comfortable or I have restless leg or I'm having hot and cold flashes because of the hormone changes or I'm nauseous. These are all things we need to discuss and try to find ways and alternative interventions to help with this. So the initial visit, they come to you instead of going to OBGYN, you do your screening, you talk about risk factors, complete history, physical exam, you can start the lab test, and then we're going to refer them to OBGYN. Are there some places that don't have OBGYN available and you may be doing some of these other visits? Absolutely. So having a basic knowledge is important. So 10 to 12 weeks, we want to see them. And each time we're seeing them, we're checking their urine, looking to see if they have a urinary tract infection, if we can palpate the fundal height, see where the top of that uterus is, seeing if we can hear fetal heart tones. Is there any vaginal bleeding? Are you having any vaginal discharge? Are you having any back pain, belly pain, nausea, vomiting? Are you able to eat and drink? Any swelling in the feet? Any pain in the calves? Are you having shortness of breath, chest pain? These are all things that we're gonna systematically walk through every time we see a pregnant patient. And if they're coming in to see you for something else, you should always still be evaluating the fact that yes, they are pregnant. We don't just take that to the wayside because they're here for a cold. You know, I see them for an upper respiratory. We talk about anticipatory guidance and interventions. Then I say, so how are we doing with the pregnancy? Are you having any bleeding? Are you having any cramping? Any vaginal discharge? Is, you know, burning with urination. Get yourself into that habit with these pregnant women. Asthma is exacerbated a lot of times during pregnancy. Um, avoiding triggers. It's very difficult with asthmatics because they can't take some of the medications in pregnancy, but helping them to understand to avoid those triggers 
um, to monitor their peak flow rates if they can at home, continue their medication plan, and also having that dialogue with OBGYN so that everybody's on the same page. Diabetes, risk factors, we see our lower socioeconomic, that disparities of health with the Hispanic and Native Americans. We look at their diet, their exercise. You can have significant complications. You can have a very large baby. So we call that LGA, large for gestational age, right? These are your 10, 12 pound babies because the sugars were not well controlled and well, guess where it went? You now have a very large baby. You run into problems with, is mom gonna be able to deliver this baby now because it's so large? Other complications that can happen. They can end up having elevated bilirubin levels. And there's lots of things that can happen with not monitoring and controlling these chronic medical conditions. Hypertension, do they have hypertension prior to the pregnancy? Are they pre-hypertensive? We're looking at these blood pressures when we're seeing these patients, monitoring them for preeclampsia, eclampsia, looking at the fetal well-being with fetal heart tones, reviewing those records that are coming from OBGYN so you have an idea of how your patient is doing. Bleeding in pregnancy can be common, but again, we don't just say, oh, you're pregnant, it's just a little bit of spotting, no big deal. No, we rule out those other conditions. Unilateral abdominal pain is very important as well when you're looking at bleeding in pregnancy. Why? We're looking for the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy. We want to look for fetal heart tones. Are you going to take on that responsibility that you say, oh, they've got fetal heart tones, just monitor the bleeding? Absolutely not. You're going to have them see their OBGYN or you're going to make sure that there is follow-up with an ultrasound sooner than later and within those 24 hours so that way we don't miss something. You can have a fetal heart tone and 10 minutes later there's no fetal heart tone and you don't want to be responsible for a fetal demise because we didn't follow and talk to the specialist and make sure that baby is safe and therefore mom is safe as well. We look at ectopic pregnancies, they have the pelvic pain, vaginal bleeding, why it's so important to do pregnancy tests on women that come in with saying, oh, I have this abdominal pain, oh, I'm not really sure. Check a pregnancy test, see if it's possible. Again, this is a referral out to GYN. Spontaneous abortions, unfortunately, this can happen, very common with high alcohol, caffeine intake, and drug use with the smoking, because remember, those are teratogens. Advanced maternal age, unfortunately, this is an increased risk factor. They have the vaginal bleeding, the cramping. Interventions, of course, we're gonna be talking to OBGYN. However, what if they can't get them in and, and can't see them right away? We're sending them to the ER. Well, what if the patient won't go to the ER? We're trying to set up an outpatient ultrasound. We're trying to get them in to see somebody and we're documenting everything that we're doing because of our concern for a possible spontaneous abortion. STIs can happen, of course, during pregnancy. Um, you know, this is why we monitor for high-risk sexual behavior and we do that education. Again, why we do the screening tools early in the pregnancy. Other conditions, your hyperemesis gravidarum with the persistent vomiting, they can get dehydrated, may need admissions into the hospital for fluid. Urinary tract infections are very common, anemia, sickle cell trait and disease. Again, family health history, so you understand that. <clears throat> and then you're gonna make sure that they're following up with the specialists. High risk. That advanced maternal age, like we talked about, ectopics are common, multiple pregnancies, spontaneous abortions. We look at other medical disorders with the preeclampsia, gestational diabetes. And again, that preconception counseling, making sure we're having that discussion with the patient, we're monitoring their sugars, monitoring their blood pressure, monitoring their vital signs and urine every time they see us, even if they're not there for that reason. Multiple pregnancies, as we know, monozygotic, mono means one, one fertilized egg splits. Those are your identical twins, your maternal twins. And then you have the um, diazotic, which is two. Multiple eggs are fertilized, that's your fraternal twins. Oftentimes it's genetic, it runs in the family. 
However, there is a concern with congenital abnormalities as one baby getting more of a placenta than another when it's monozygotic. Is there cord entanglement because there's limited room in the uterus? These things are very important to consider. Birth weights, you can have one baby that's a lot larger than the other baby. Again, things that will be monitored by the OBGYN. Gestational trophoblactic disease is kind of a grouping of uh, rare tumors that begin in pregnancy. Um, you've heard them referred to as like hydatiform moles or molar tumors. Most oftentimes these are non-cancerous. Rarely do they develop into cancer, but again, if you find this, this is again, you know what you don't know, you refer them out to OBGYN. Risk factors, age of less than 20, greater than 35, bleeding, large uterus, you have all of those symptoms of pregnancy. Abnormalities in the amniotic fluid, you can have too much, you can have too little. Again, these are going to be monitored by the OB. But knowing that, hey, my patient has this issue, if they ask me about something or we're talking about things, I need to make sure I'm paying attention because I know that if they have too much fluid, the polyhydraminose, that they're at risk for preterm delivery, premature rupture of membranes, that placenta can ab abrupt, abrupt. When I know they have the oligohydraminose, we know that there can be some renal, renal malformations. That placenta cannot sometimes make it to term and they have to be delivered early. You can have decelerations on fetal non-stress tests where their heart rate is dropping when they're moving because there's such little fluid and they have that placental insufficiency. So understanding and knowing what your patient has, even though you're not managing it, is important. If they've had a transplant, just a few things to understand that you know, you need to know, was it cancer related? Was there issues with radiation and exposure? They're considered high risk. What did HEMOC say about them or their transplant surgeon about getting pregnant? Knowing that, risk of complications because they're on immunosuppressive therapy. Again, you don't need to know this in your head, but have the resources available if this pertains to your patient. When we look at other syndromes, we have those hemolysis, elevated LFTs, low platelets. We look at coagulation defects. Some women um, have factor instability and they have hematological conditions where they have excess platelets. So we already know they're at a higher risk for thrombus. So if we know that this is in place, we're having that close follow-up with hematology as well as OBGYN some women are placed on heparin therapy during their pregnancy to help prevent clots. Again, knowing where the referrals need to be and making sure that that patient is following up with the specialist that they need to. Isoimmunization, this is your maternal fetal blood incompatibility when we look at that RH with the positive and negatives. Um, you know, we test mom when we do her type and RH factor. Um, in pregnancy when they come in to deliver as well because we want to look for that maternal fetal blood incompat incompatibility, right? We do not want antibodies to be passed if there's that incompatibility, correct? So we look for the symptoms in baby. Do they have pallor? Do they have jaundice, bruising, edema? Do they end up having seizures? Blood type and screen is important, looking at that RH, which OBGYN should be doing, but you should have some knowledge of this. Recurrent pregnancy loss, cervical insufficiency, multiple um, miscarriages, spontaneous abortions, um, the etiology, why is it happening? Again, referring out, oftentimes if they've had multiple um, abortions or premature deliveries, OBGYN is doing an MRI of the pelvis to take a look and see what's going on. Intimate partner violence, remember screening tools, very high risk in teenagers and African Americans with that low socioeconomic status, that disparities of health. Screening should be routine all the time, especially in pregnancy. This is a higher incidence when they're pregnant for partner violence.
looking at the intrapartum and postpartum care, looking at the labor. Um, again, if you're going to be an L&D NP or going on to be a midwife, these are things you'll have to know in more detail. However, a brief overview, just understanding the physiology of the estrogen and progesterone shift, knowing the signs of labor, cervical dilatation, spontaneous rupture of membranes, that bloody show you can have, knowing there's those three stages, just having an understanding. Latent phase, up to five centimeters. Active, six to eight. Transition, eight to 10. You say, well, what if they don't make it to it? They don't make it to it. Then they have a C-section. Then they never, never made it to the transition phase. Remember, your stage two is delivery of that infant. And stage three is then delivery of that placenta. Management in stage one, just knowing this is when the fetus is presenting with those... Um, with that cervix dilating, there can be oxytocin that is being given. Comfort is important. Stage two, the fetus is descending. We're looking at the well-being, positioning the client for delivery, and this is the delivery of the baby. Stage three, remember, is delivery of that placenta. We're clamping the cord, deliver the placenta, evaluate the maternal status. We are massaging that uterus, assessing for hemorrhage, these are all important factors in each stage in the management. Complications, unfortunately, if you have an epidural, they might not feel um, the contractions and they may not progress in their labor. Knowing that there's multiple resources out there and discussing with patients who wanna have that alternative medicine, wanna use a doula, may wanna deliver at home. You may not agree with it. However, you need to make sure you are being supportive and that you're helping them find resources. Perineal trauma, again, you might see them afterwards if they've had an episiotomy. Looking at the site, assessing for redness, edema, bruising, discharge, and then approximation. Ice is applied, sits fast, and then continue that treatment at home. C-sections oftentimes are scheduled, uh, risk of trauma, infection, high-risk conditions. Um, it has been very controversial if it is elective, if you want to deliver on a certain day for whatever reason, or just don't want to go through childbirth. Remember, there's a lot more risks that are going through this, as well as recovery time. This is a major abdominal surgery. Uh, labor dystocia um, is the expulsive forces of the uterus, so therefore the power of that uterus, the condition of ineffective, and the position or size or presentation of the fetus is passenger, and then the maternal pelvis or the soft tissue is passage. Hypotonic labor is when there's insufficient uh, pressure. Hypertonic labor is insufficient coordination. Precipitous labor is considered less than three hours. Fetal presentation uh, breach, it can be complete. The feet can come out first, it can be frank, um, you know, a transverse lie as well is another uh, position. If you see a foot coming out um, and you're in the office, you are calling 911, um, you know, knowing that your patient does have a breech pregnancy is important. Um, fetal malposition, if the back of their head is posterior or they're coming out brow first or coming out face first. Um, twin gestations most oftentimes are delivered by cesarean. Then we have shoulder dystocia. This is where the shoulders are too large for the pelvis. This is where sometimes there has to be a reduction and then you run into that risk of nerve damage with the shoulders of the fetus. And then nuchal cord, the cord is around the neck. Um, again, if you see a cord protruding through the vagina when you're seeing your patient, you are on the phone, 911, and the recommendation is to put your hand right up there and relieve pressure and you put your hand there and you do not move. And that's what it is. Again, it's uh, very difficult if it's something you've never dealt with. This does not happen very often in the office, but just understanding that if you see that cord coming down or that foot coming down, you are on the phone calling 911. Postpartum complications. Um, epidurals, of course, you can have that spinal headache. There can be hemorrhage after a C-section, lacerations, hematomas, um, fevers. We watch for urinary tract infections, mastitis, especially newly breastfeeding. 
wound infections, we worry about thromboembolism, cardiomyopathy, you know, all these different things. And this is why it's important to discuss. Are you having shortness of breath? Are you having any chest pain, pain in your calves? Are we getting up? Are we moving around? And then we have to look at the psychosocial. You're, you're transitioning into motherhood. Yes, as a first time mother, it's all new, but even second, third, what about those stressors of other children at home? And if you're a working mother or have no support system, there's a difference, baby blues, where they're a little bit saddened with things. And then we look at postpartum depression, which is a little bit more of a progression where you're saying, hey, we need to be referring these patients out for help and counseling. And then ultimately the postpartum psychosis where some women have to be hospitalized and unfortunately do harm their children. Definition and scope, depression is uh, onset of four to six weeks after birth, changes in eating habits, insomnia, decreased concentration, suicidal ideations, not so much homicidal ideations against the child, it's more with themselves. Treatment, we look at SSRIs and different management, um, and again, referring them out for counseling. Postpartum discharge considerations is, you know, Family Medical Leave Act. What is the financial burden that's going to be on here? Rest and recovery, sexuality. Is there that pressure at home? Okay, when is she going to be able to have sex again? What other contraception should I start on now? When should I start? What if I want to breastfeed? What other things I can look for? You know, that little bit of newborn care with sleep and car safety, discharge instructions, home visits. And again, the OBGYN and those that specialize in this are going to be doing it more, but having an understanding because they're most likely going to ask you a lot of these questions because they trust you. You're their primary care physician unless you do go into the specialty. References are your textbooks readings um, listed there.